thank you, Dennis, for the introduction. And I also want to thank Debbie Drost from the Center for Faith and Inquiry, who's been tremendously helpful in making it possible for me to be here today. And I'd also like to thank Gordon College for the invitation um, and also your presence here because I have a talk to give, but I also have a lot of questions in my mind. So maybe you also can help with some of the solutions. In looking at religious freedom after the Arab Spring, this was a topic that I suggested we'd kind of narrowed down a year ago, at which time I was expecting things to get worse before they get better, but a year later now, I think we are still very much in the midst of what is generally labeled Arab Spring. And the aspects of religious freedom I'd like to speak about are in the midst of this upheaval with an eye towards where is it going to be headed afterwards. Now, why religious freedom? Not only is it the answer to every question, as Dennis explained, but also uh, I'd like to emphasize that my interest in speaking about this topic today is not just because Gordon College is a Christian college. I really think that the religious freedom issue and the questions about the role of religion in society, in the Arab societies today, is absolutely vital to figuring out a path forward. As the Christian Science Monitor pointed out in 2011, after the upheaval in Tunisia, they said, politics became largely a shouting match between the moderate Islamist and Nahda party and a host of secular parties over the role of religion in public life. Again and again and again in these societies right now, this question is um, central right now. I think it's a central point of conflict, and I think ultimately it's going to have to become a source of reconciliation and stability. Today, I would like to focus on four main areas. Um, the first is going to be religious freedom for the majority in Sunni Muslim Arab societies. So religious freedom for the majority in these Muslim societies. And I'll explain why I'm going to focus on the majority instead of minority issues. This is going to be a bad news story, so I will be bringing you the bad news first. But I'd like to touch briefly on why I am overall optimistic for the future. Um, thirdly, I'll have some thoughts on what the US should do, primarily the government, but also a role for the private sector. And then in closing, I have some considerations and questions that are on my mind personally as a Christian when I am looking at this issue. So first, religious freedom for the majority. At this time, religious minorities in Arab countries are suffering terribly, worse than they have in decades. And it's persecution in which people are dying, people are losing their homes, people are fleeing, um, they are refugees. For me, it is because the situation is so terrible with religious freedom for minorities that I've chosen today to focus on the majority. I really think, and here's an issue where I would really like to see more research from political scientists and others. I think that countries going through periods of religious persecution first need to figure out religious freedom for the majority before there really is hope for a long-term mechanism in society and a building of culture which will protect religious freedom for the minorities. Now, um, before we get to the Middle East, I would like to start here in Boston since we happen to be in the Boston area, with a story that may be familiar to many of you, but for me, there are absolutely vital lessons in this when we look at the Arab Spring. In the mid-1600s in Boston, with the Puritans having political control in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and I'm not a historian here, so I'm gonna give a very rough picture of this, um, in 1659, 1660, and 1661, there were public executions of Quakers. And um, the majority at that time, it, at least 
active in political society. So if we temporarily set aside the question of the native population of the US at the time, if we look at the active political population of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the majority were Christians. And so this is um, religious persecution that is inside of the majority group with one part of the majority using state power for persecution of another part of it. And um, in this situation where there are, you know, think about this, there are public hangings of Quakers because of their religious belief, because of their understanding of what Christianity is. And they are being persecuted and hung publicly by other Christians who have a different understanding of what Christianity is. There's then intervention um, from the British. There are also other figures at this time, like Roger Williams, who are casting a different vision of a way to structure society. And the way forward was not to pull the Puritans out of power and put the Quakers in. The way forward was to say that this, you know, power managing the colony was going to be neutral, relatively neutral, towards defining religious doctrine. So as I go forward, I want you to keep that story in mind, and I'll return to it again later on. So in looking at religious freedom in the Arab Spring, I want to look primarily at Tunisia with a little excursion into Kuwait, and then Egypt. Um, when I look at Egypt, I want to comment on some issues that are very broad, high-level issues about religious freedom. But first, in looking at Tunisia, I've chosen a very, very, very specific topic to look at today because I think we need to look at how these tensions about religious freedom are being played out in day-to-day -day life. I want to look at the issue in Tunisia of controversy at one university over whether or not Muslim women wearing a facial veil will be allowed on campus participating in the university. This is a controversy in Tunisia between Muslims and the way that this university has been dealing with it has been indicative of a whole lot of other problems in society. So over the last two years, the administration at one of the major universities in the capital has banned women from wearing a facial veil on campus. Now, Tunisia, um, being you know, relatively far away among the Arab countries from the Arabian Peninsula, doesn't have some of the cultural traditions which favor wearing a facial veil. Tunisia has traditionally been more open. Many women don't cover their heads. Um, some women just wear a headscarf, but some do wear a facial veil. Now, they themselves are diverse. I know women who wear a facial veil, and the individuals who do do so for very different reasons. But there's a lot of perception in Tunisia that the facial veil is associated with very hardcore, politicized interpretations of Islam. Tunisia and Algeria have had terrible violence in the last 20 years, and there's a great deal of fear built up about these movements. But in banning the facial veil on campus, it has led to protests um, by those who advocate for wearing the facial veil. They're often identified as Salafis, which I find a little bit of a problematic term, but we'll call them the Salafi, the more hardcore fundamentalist, uh, often politicized Muslim movements in Tunisia. They have protested against the university, they have shut the university down, and as I was reading this, I thought this can only lead to conflict escalation. What I see happening at this university is those who are in charge of the university are teaching the lesson in day-to-day -day life that when you have power, what you can do is tell other people what to do. And I think that these university administrators and others supporting them are almost creating their own fear, because if that's what power is, then I too would be very worried that the Salafis would take over the university. I would be worried, me personally, if I were visiting there as a professor or student, that they would tell me I had to cover my face. Um, the students in day-to-day -day life, the students who wear the facial veil who've been told not to come to university, this starts to foster then situations of social ghettoization, a very homogeneous socializing in which the students wearing the facial veil 
you know, are then off campus, they're not having contact with others who are different from them, they're less likely to be developing relationships in society with those who are different, they're less likely to be hearing ideas, which will be challenging theirs, and importantly, they are not learning that, okay, you can hold these views, if you believe that you should wear the facial veil, this is your particular interpretation of your religion, you're allowed to do that, but along with that comes the obligation that you allow others to have a view that is different than yours. And this is what is not being exercised, practiced, and learned right now in these societies where it is the teeter-totter just keeps going from side to side with each side trying to use power to tell the other what to do. So I really think that rather than betting on the people who have ideas that we kind of like and trying to push them into power, that the US and others would be much better right now to help create mechanisms and forums where individuals inside their own society can find a way to get along, but within limits. Um, and this is where our constitution um, stuns me in how brilliant it is. Because the government is gonna stay out of religion, religion is gonna stay out of government. You've got freedom, but you also need to let others have their own freedom. Um, and so I'd like to look at how Kuwait and how Muslims in Kuwait are handling these different interpretations inside of their own religion. There's a medical school in Kuwait. Uh, in Kuwait, culturally, there are more Muslim women who wear a facial veil. But the um, head of the medical school um, was very in favor of women's education, a little more well, liberal and progressive, let's say. And he also had a concern about um, hygiene in the labs, that if women had um, a piece of cloth over their face, they're breathing in and out of it, you think germs, and, you're, and then they walk into the lab, they're bringing that with them. Um, and so he had created a rule that in Kuwait there would be no women with a facial veil. But there were many in Kuwait, including very conservative Muslims, who wanted women to be doctors and have education. So they came up with a compromise that the university set up two separate labs. And there's a men's lab and a women's lab. And because the women's lab is led by women and all the students are women, the women don't have to bring the facial veil in. Now, I talked to somebody who was remotely involved in this and I said, well, how about just have the women completely change clothes and have a clean you know, um, niqab or facial veil to put on? And he said, huh, we hadn't thought about that. But they found a way, a compromise for to make it work. And at the medical school with women who are studying there, um, there are women who choose to cover their faces, and there are women who don't. But the women who choose to cover their faces understand that they can't go in and force others um, how to dress based on religious interpretation. And so I think there's a much healthier long-term society building there of people who are different learning to get along. Mm. Lastly on Kuwait, um, I'd like to now take us back to the contrast with Tunisia and how is Tunisia going to find its way forward out of this. Yesterday, the International Crisis Group came out with a report and recommendations on Tunisia. International Crisis Group I respect greatly. They do a lot of very good work. But I have to say I was stunned with how um, strongly I disagreed with their recommendations about religion in Tunisia. And I don't know for sure, this is just my suspicion from reading the report, that it was written by a group of very skilled, knowledgeable, political scientists, regional experts, whose education had somehow just sort of left religion out of the picture. Because the report has a lot of good recommendations, but when it gets to religion, I just wondered, what were these people thinking? So here were their recommendations. There were two. That, and they didn't say who should do this, but it kind of implied the government should provide greater coherence to an increasingly cacophonous religious space while reassuring secularists. Again, they want the government or somebody to provide greater coherence to an increasingly cacophonous religious space. Let me just take this first recommendation. I argue the opposite. Allow the cacophony, but 
Get people used to the fact that there will be a cacophony and there will be disagreements. Have a space where religious believers can explore what their faith is with each other, and that's going to mean disagreement. The second recommendation in this report was for the religious affairs ministry of the country, the Grand Mosque, which is the most prominent mosque in the country, as well as political and civil organizations. The International Crisis Group recommended that they should issue, after widespread consultation, a charter to guide religious teaching at the Grand Mosque that would promote a version of Islam rooted in Tunisia's reformist movement and adapted to contemporary challenges. I found this highly problematic, and I think this would be prone to increasing the conflict if the government were to choose an interpretation of Islam and try to endorse it as the official one. Let's go back to Boston now in the 1600s. I imagine a situation if the British had come in and said, Puritans, you've messed up, we're pulling you out of power, we're putting the Quakers in power, and the Quakers are gonna to get to write the school books for religious education for your children, that the um, Puritans would have been very angry and extra riled up on two levels. First of all, bitterness, and second of all, because you're teaching that when you have power you can tell other people what to do, I think they would have had motivation to fight, even a bloody fight, to try to take over the power. But because the situation was resolved, by separating the governance of the colony from religious interpretation, they were able to move towards what eventually became the mechanisms of religious freedom we have in this country. So in Tunisia, I think this recommendation that the government should choose an interpretation of Islam and then try to teach it simply as Islam is not going to work. Islam is inherently very diverse. There are tremendously different interpretations, and especially today, after quite a few centuries of relative quiet in Islamic intellectual life, there are amazing internal debates going on. You simply are not going to convince believers at an authentic level that a simple, single interpretation um, is really all there is to the story. So next, I'd like to move to Egypt. And here the situation is very, very bad. Uh, as I got into doing some research for preparing this talk, I think the situation is much worse than what we're reading in a lot of Western media. And most of our Western media stories are very bad news stories. Um, what really got me worried was a situation that has to do with President Morsi letting somebody out of prison this past fall. So in 1992, a um, very innovative intellectual who was very critical of religious fundamentalists named Farag Foda was assassinated in Egypt, and it was a targeted assassination in public. Two individuals who killed him were um, executed by the Mubarak government in the 90s. But another man who had been an accomplice to the murder was put in prison. Well, this past fall, this man got let out of prison. And there is a fascinating Egyptian talk show that I had hoped to bring you part of the video, but I, it hasn't come out yet with any subtitling, and it's all in Arabic. Um, but this man was on this talk show this fall, and in the interview with him, there's no remorse. Um, and he, uh, he claims that he was the victim, as a Muslim religious believer, that he was acting out of self-defense in murdering Farag Foda. And I was also very struck by how intellectually lazy this man was. Um, the arguments he presents as a Muslim for why he did this were much more like rhetoric that you'd see in a newspaper. Um, he says, for example, he you know, had to kill an apostate, he says, because he was following the Sunnah of Muhammad, the practices that are associated with Muhammad's life. 
But when I look today at the discussions Muslims are having about religious freedom, and those who are going and mining their own tradition, for example, there is no um, known case in Muhammad's lifetime of Muhammad killing anybody for leaving this new faith of Islam. In fact, there are accounts of individuals coming to believe in Muhammad's message. Then those individuals left and they said, I don't believe anymore. But then they come back to faith a while later. Well, they never could have come back to faith if somebody who left the faith, um, if the punishment was killing. Um, and there are a lot of other resources going on today with Muslim discussions about religious freedom that in this case where this man who's arguing that murder, and this was vigilante murder, for another person's beliefs is just fine, this is another argument for having religious freedom for the majority for Muslims now, because the only arguments that are really going to be able to shoot this guy down, figuratively speaking, um, are going to be the religious arguments, but there's got to be this public space for Muslims to disagree and to present different views about how they understand their own religion. And that is not happening right now. Um, increasingly in these countries, the governments are moving back to some of their authoritarian ways, imprisoning people for things they write in the newspaper and say in public. So, I'd like to, believe it or not, move from murder and vigilante violence to why I'm actually optimistic. Uh, and this would be, to cover this fully, we'd have to have a whole semester class here at Gordon College. So I'm not going to be able to, but I did um, provide a list of recommended reading and resources that cover some of my um, ideas on this in much, much more depth. And I believe that's gonna be available online um, at the website for this talk, and I think there may be some handouts on this. And it's this, when I went to the Witherspoon Institute in Princeton after leaving the Department of Defense, the main question I focused on was, what are Muslims today writing and saying about religious freedom? Because I view religious freedom as the log in the log jam, especially when we look at high conflict societies like the Arab countries, which are only about 15 to 18% of Muslims in the world, but, they're going to be, a, when we look at those, the um, issue of religion in society and relation of government to religion is blocking development of a whole lot of other issues. So I became very, very interested in this. And what I found going on in intra-Muslim dis discussion was far better than what I had thought would be there. I really wasn't sure what would be there because this was an area of doctrinal development in Islam that I, I just wasn't as familiar with. But the Muslims I find who are going back, and they're doing it for faith reasons. They're not doing it out of, well, I like living in the West and I want to show that Islam is compatible in the West. Instead, these are Muslims who are asking at a much deeper level, what does it mean to follow Muhammad? When they're going back and looking at the Quran, which says there is no compulsion in religion, and they're trying to understand the context of that, when they're going back and looking at the life of Muhammad, they feel that religious freedom for Muslims themselves and for other believers um, is something that they, one of them who's writing an article on this right now, he says Islam is very at home with religious freedom. And a key part of their argument for this is that Islam itself is a belief, it's a faith. And you can't have faith if there is compulsion. And it may sound like a very basic argument, but in these societies where religion is very tied up with ethnic identity, where it's very tied up with certain political perceptions, that discussion often just isn't happening. So, when also when I talk with Muslims who are pushing back on religious freedom, they never give me a religious reason. For example, I had a discussion with a Saudi recently who said that he as a Muslim believes there should be allowed to be churches in his country. So I said, so? When, when do we start building one? And he said, well, we can't do that. Because if we had one, somebody would attack it and we'd have violence and instability. So he's making a security argument. He's making a political argument. 
Um, but I think over time, um, and especially now that Muslims are active in so many different parts of the world, including many countries where they have freedom of speech, and as their ideas begin to be translated into other languages, um, that we're going to see a richer religious discussion about freedom of religion. Uh, but it's going to take time, and between now and then, I think there will be a great deal of suffering um, and even people dying. So I don't expect it to get better soon, but I do think the capacities are present for a development that in the long run um, is a much more comfortable situation. So just briefly some thoughts on, well, we are speaking here, I'm speaking as an American here in the US. Um, I've worked for the US government for years, and I'm speaking as an individual right now, not for the government, but I do wonder, well, what should the US do? And also, religious freedom promotion is officially part of our foreign policy since the 1998 International Religious Freedom Act. I think right now that America's commitment to democracy, um, which includes religious freedom, is being put to the test when we look at the Arab Spring. Um, I think that America has some coming to terms to do in looking at the dictatorships we have supported, um, both in the mess that this has created and looking at what we're supporting. On the resource list I provided, one of the books on there is a new autobiography by a guy named Majid Nawaz, who was very active in a radical Islamist group called Hizbut Tahrir, that's trying to build a global caliphate. And uh, for his work in that, he was put in prison in Egypt for several years, and he has quite a detailed account in his book of what it is, was like under Mubarak to be in prison. Um, and our country was supporting an autocracy that systematically engaged in torture. His book is also very helpful for, for realizing why the hardcore Islamists and even some of the mild-mannered Islamists who were put in prison by, by Mubarak are so angry and bitter right now. Um, his, his account of that, I think, is gonna help Americans see what we were supporting, um, and also provide some window onto why there's such a mess. And his book is also very interesting because as time went on, he um, came to reject this radical ideology quite dramatically, and he's very active now in advocating for and supporting development of civil society and countering his, he founded a think tank that focuses on countering extremism in Muslim communities and he's working with other Muslims on this. For the US, I also think it's very important that we support systems in the Arab Middle East. If we look at it, for example, like a horse race. We need to stop choosing one horse and betting on it and trying to prop up that one horse. And we need to support systems in which there's going to be ongoing races. And this one will win that time, another will win that time. But there is enough of a soundly built and supported structure, especially through good constitutions, um, that these races can continue. And in that, there's a really important element of stability that we need to move towards, not short-term stability, but only by supporting a dictator, which then collapses and leads to these terrible crises like now. Thirdly, uh, I think that one area, if we want to promote and support religious freedom in the Arab Middle East, has got to be an investment in polling. I think that we as Americans really don't understand what it is that other people hear or think when we say religious freedom. A Jordanian friend of mine who's super pro-democracy and she recently got an American passport and was so thrilled that she cried when she got her passport. She loves living in the US. But when you say religious freedom to her, she says, oh no, no, that means that my 16-year-old sister is gonna be out in the streets dressed like Britney Spears. She hears freedom and thinks wild, crazy, licentious free-for-all. I think that we don't understand that people are hearing something very different when we say religious freedom. And I think this would help us find ways to better explain what it is we mean by religious freedom. And I think it would help us um, 
you know, it would encourage us also to spend more time showing historical examples, our own difficulties that we had in our country, that religious freedom isn't something that you either have or don't have. It's something that you can move to out of situations where people are killing each other. But we're doing a very poor job of promoting this and supporting this, and I think part of it is we don't understand what the resistance is. And I really think polling and better understanding public opinion will be one tool to help support that. In conclusion, because I really want to leave time for question and answer, um, I want to touch on one question that keeps me awake at night, uh, or that I wonder about. For me, it's, what does it mean to love my brothers and sisters in this situation? What does it mean authentically to love persecutors? I don't think there is any love to persecutors in saying, well, you should just go ahead and do what you're doing. Um, I don't think that's good for the persecutors, and it's clearly a tragedy for the persecuted. Uh, when I look at persecution, I look at individuals whose own situation, there's something that they're incredibly afraid of, so much so that they're willing to murder others. So these are people who are carrying a burden. That worries me. I also wonder if persecutors are individuals who um, have a, a wrapped up self-identity in their religion and haven't felt the freedom of belief. Uh, so I, th I think also loving the persecutor means wanting to foster an, an environment where deep personal reflection and belief is possible. Um, I don't entirely have an answer to this question of well, what does it mean to love our neighbors in this situation, including those who are persecuting, but it's a question I want to leave with you because I think it's one we need in which we need more understanding. Thank you, and I'm open to questions. <laughs>